to us, include the people you set in our lives. We thank you for Pastor Matt and the gift of the scriptures, your word. And so now speak to us, encourage us through your servant, through your word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. If you guys want to turn in your Bibles, we're going to take a few minutes. We're going to look at Colossians chapter 1 and a little bit of Colossians chapter 2. We're going to jump around just a little bit between those two chapters. To be honest, I had a small panic attack this morning um, between somewhere between my house and here this morning. I lost an entire page out of my Bible, and then I found it in the car, um, and it happens to be the Philippians, uh, the, the last part of Philippians, first part of Colossians. So, you know, this is what happens when you read your Bible every day, all the day long, it f- eventually falls apart. Um, but I got in here, and I started just to kind of review, and I was like, oh, wait a second. There's a whole entire chapter. But, hey, good, good news. Um, there's also other Bibles in here that I'm sure have the same exact verses. <clears throat> All right, we're going to read Colossians 1. This happens all the time in my life, just this is how things function for me. Colossians chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 15. Today is Christ the King Sunday, and, and really I, I can't imagine another passage of Scripture that really kind of fully encapsulate what, encapsulates what it means for Christ to be King, for the supremacy of who Christ is, supremacy of the Son of God. Verse 15 starts this way, it says, the Son, <clears throat> excuse me, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church, He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God, and you were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now... He has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusations. If, there's that word again, if you continue in faith established and firm and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you have heard that has been proclaimed to you from every creature under heaven of which I, Paul, have become a servant. What a powerful statement that Paul is saying here about who Christ is. In confirmation, how many people here from confirmation? If you're in confirmation now, we're in confirmation. When we start talking about who Jesus is, one of the things is we say Jesus is Lord, right? And on that we say that Jesus is Lord and he must be, wow, I don't know who's teaching confirmation, but must be. Oh, it must be obeyed. Jesus is Lord as must be obeyed. Jesus Christ is King and must be obeyed. One thing we read in this, in this scripture is that he is over all things. He's in all things. All things are made for him, by him, through him. Everything is his and he is in charge. And what he's looking for is a people that are obedient. Christ is King means that he's the one that's in charge, not us. And this is a battle we have every single day of our life of who's in charge. We can confess all day long that Christ is king. But how long does it take for us in the middle of a day to decide, oh, wait, no, I want this decision. I want to make this decision. I want to, I want to go in this direction. This is what I prefer. This is what I like. This is what I want to do. But here Paul is saying that all things are here. That all things are from him and for him and to him. And he's bringing everything back to him. He is looking for a people. It says that he is the head of the body. That that is why he came. He is king over the kingdom. He's not looking just to rule. He's not looking just to make rules. He's not looking just to sit on the throne. He's looking to have a people. A kingdom that he rules and that he reigns over and that he pushes forward into this world. It's part of his redemption plan 
for the world is his body of Christ. There's a couple of things as we read through this passage of scripture and jump into chapter two that we begin to see who our king is. Because Jesus Christ as king is, is different than any other king that ever has been or ever will be. No matter if you call them king or you call them president or you call them boss, there is nobody that is like him. His kingdom and his ruling is different than anything else you will ever see. One of the first things he does is in verse 21, chapter 1, verse 20 says, Once you were alienated from God and you were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Our king is one who sacrificed his life so that we may be reconciled to God. He doesn't just come in with an iron scepter. He doesn't just come in with a sword yielding and making all the rules. He comes in, and one of the first things he says is he reconciles us back to him. Once we were people that were far from him because of all the sin in our life, he says, but then I have reconciled you by Christ's body through the death, through his death, to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. This is the king we serve. One who is willing to lay his life down so that you may be reconciled. So that then there is the body of Christ. But as Pastor Billy was saying just a minute ago, the next word is, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held from the gospel. This is the gospel that you have heard and that has proclaimed to you every creature under heaven of, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. There is a call on us inside of this kingdom, and it's to hold fast to the faith, to be established and to be firm in understanding who Christ our King is. Let's read a little further, verse one, uh, chapter 1, verse 24. Paul says this, says, Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regards to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. For the sake of his body. This was Paul speaking. He says, for the sake of his body, the church. That's you and me. That is the power of what God is deciding to do here in this, in this earth is, is through the body of Christ, through me and through you, through the ones who are reconciled to him. He says, I have become a servant by the commission of God gave to me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. It's the mystery that's been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of his mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone full, fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ has so powerfully works in me. The second thing that we see here about who our, our king is, Christ our king, one is, is that he reconciles us to us, but two, he's one who reveals things. He's one who reveals things to us. Said, <clears throat> to, the, to, to them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you. We have a king who doesn't just sit on a throne and hide things and withhold things, but he begins to reveal things to us. Here it says he reveals the, the mystery of Christ in me. Christ in you, the hope of glory. As, as we bow our knee and as we be, become more and more obedient to him, he begins to reveal more and more things to you. As you begin to step out in faith, step out in obedience, he begins to reveal more and more of who he is. He re somehow begins to reveal more and more his faithfulness every single time. When you can't think uh, that he can be any more faithful, and you step out one more time, and he's there every time. He is a king who reconciles, and he is a king who reveals. I want to jump down to chapter 2, verse 6. It says, so then, just as you received Christ, Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. In the midst of, of this, I, I just want to take just a minute as we're talking about who Christ the King is, I, I want to remind us who 
we are and what we're called to do. I was talking with Pastor Billy the other day about discipleship and, and, and following after people and learning from other people. And you read throughout the Bible, we talked about it a little bit last week, that a lot of discipleship has to do with the person who is being discipled and how willing and how committed they are to being discipled, to being corrected or instructed and, and taught. When we read through the Bible and we see, you know, as Jesus called the disciples, their willingness to drop everything and to follow him and to stay with him. That's our call. Here it says, just, so then just as you receive Christ as Lord, continue to live. Continue to live your lives rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. Those are things that are all in our control. Those aren't magic things that God just does in our life. It's not some kind of thing that Jesus just kind of moves and makes us thankful or he, he makes us rooted or he makes us built up. Those are things that we are, are in charge of, that we are, are part of this kingdom building thing, that we are called to, to tie ourselves close to the Lord, to tie ourselves close to other Christians, to, to come to church, to come to small group, to grow up in him. It's not just magic. We pray this over Maddie every night. All of our kids have verses. This is the one we pray over him. And I prayed over him not so that he will just become rooted and built up. Not so just I figure if I say it enough times, it'll just happen. What I'm hoping is we prayed over him enough times he'll realize this is what I need to do. That he needs to be rooted and built up in Christ, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. Overflowing with thankfulness is, is, a, is a mind issue. What are you thankful for? What are you dwelling on? In the midst of every single day, there's always something to be thankful for. Honestly, if you're awake and it's the middle of the day, you should be thankful that you're awake and it's the middle of the day. So where is our mind in that? Let's keep reading. Chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 8 says, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all of the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought into the fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands, but by God's hands, your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive in Christ. He forgave us all of our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing, triumphing over them by the cross. The last thing that our, our king does is he fills you with the fullness of Christ, the fullness of himself. He's, he's promising that there's nothing that he will hold back. That it's Christ in you, the hope of glory, that he has been filled with the fullness of God and that he promises to fill you with the fullness of God. To cancel all your sins, to forgive everything that's ever happened and to fill you with all the things that he has for you. These are the things that our king does. But in that, we have to submit our lives. I've said it before and I'll say it again, often we settle we settle for less than the fullness of Christ. And it's because we want to rule ourselves. We want to make our own decisions. We want to build our own accounts. We want to build our own families. We want to build our own lives. We want to build our own kingdoms. And every time we do that, we settle for less than what God has in store for you. Every time we make those decisions on our own, and even in those, in those small day-to-day -day things, we begin to settle for something less than the fullness of what God has for us. It says, I want to go back to this first part in first, uh, Colossians 1. It says, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth and invisible, uh, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authority, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. 
He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that everything might, so that in everything he might have supremacy. Everything is in him and by him and for him and through him. Why would we want to submit and obey to that? Because all of it is ruled by him. You know, all of it is ruled by him whether we submit or not. Whether we confess him as Christ the King or not, he's still in charge of it all. And I can't fathom that I would be able to come up with anything better than what he has for me. So on this Christ the King Sunday, I challenge you to be reconciled to God. To let him to begin to reveal things to you. To be obedient so that he begins to reveal more things. And to never settle for anything less than all that he has for you. But it does mean that he is Lord and must be obeyed. Our life, as I said before, is, is very simple when it comes to Christ. And it really does all boil down to obedience. Once we have given our life to him, it, it boils down to that simple thing of obedience. That is probably the most difficult thing that we ever have to do in our life. But there is the promise that if we submit to him as Christ the King, if we continue to live in the faith, if we continue to be rooted and built up in Christ, that he will fill us with the fullness of who God is. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that you indeed are Christ the King, that you rule everything, the things we see, the things we don't see, all rulers, all authorities, everything comes under you. Lord, I pray that we'd be willing to let you be king of our life, king of our decisions, king of our emotions, king of our thoughts. Lord, that we would submit all of our authority to you. All the authority we want in our lives, that we would submit it to you and follow after you and let you build us up let you establish us, Lord, that, you would let, that we would let you fill us to the fullness of God. Lord, I pray for each and every one here, Lord, that they be willing to obey, to be obedient, to serve you, Jesus Christ.